In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today I would like to speak to you about the resurrection of the body. You have to understand when, when Septuagesima occurs, that's 70 days before Easter, the church reads in her breviary the story of creation. That is to indicate to all of us that the human race is beset by sin, original sin. That original sin uh, gives us certain tendencies to evil, a certain penchant for evil. So much so that without the grace of God, we are incapable of persevering in virtue for a long time. That is, we might have, yes, certain virtues, certain natural virtues, but we cannot persevere in all good virtue. We will fall. We will commit a mortal sin eventually without the grace of God. That's the teaching of the church. So the human race, without the grace of God, sinks and constantly sinks and gets worse and worse as time goes on. We are witnessing that in this world today as we see things that are so shocking we thought that the human race could never go in that direction. And really, it, it, it is just going to sink all the more. There's nothing to stop it because of original sin and because of the effects of original sin. And the worst effect of original sin is death because we are composed of two things. One, an immortal soul that does not want to die and a mortal body, a, a body which is corruptible, made of matter, which in a sense wants to die. All matter ultimately disintegrates into something more simple, something more elemental or a very stable compound something that is put together in a very complex way, materially, always has a tendency to come apart unless it is held up by something. And that's why you eat three meals a day, for example, to keep body and soul together, to keep your body in good health, because it is constantly tending toward disintegration. But eventually, it does disintegrate. Eventually, it cannot tolerate the soul. The soul has to leave it because just like an old house that has fallen apart, you can't live in it anymore. So also, the soul must leave, and that is death. And that is the worst aspect and the worst punishment for original sin that we have. Of all the punishments, that was the worst. God also gave us the, the punishment of ch uh, pain in childbirth, uh, the punishment of the, the earth participating in all of the suffering that we have to do for sin. That's why there are violent storms and earthquakes and various other things that make life miserable. God enlisted the earth. We have to plow the, the, the soil uh, the soil gives up weeds unless we make it give up our food. That's all part of the punishment of original sin. It's in Genesis. You can read it. But death is the worst. And our Lord came in order to free us from death. And that is the resurrection of the body in the future. Now you might say, how, how is this possible that we die and then... And sometime in the future, we will rise with the same bodies, the teaching of the church, with the same bodies. Well, how did we come here in the first place? Did not God give us a life here? Were we not conceived in our mother's wombs and given a life in this earth, which in itself is such a beautiful place? When we see all of these magnificent trees blooming in the spring, we think, who made this? What, what, a, what, 
They are leftovers from paradise. They are so beautiful. And the, the, so God can make a, any kind of life for us that he wants. And we have to have confidence in that, that this is something that he will do. And this is what we celebrate today. Not only our Lord's resurrection, of course, but the, the, the effect of our Lord's resurrection upon us that we look forward to rising from the dead in the future. So I'd like to speak to you about that today. The, the resurrection of the body is a dogma of faith. It is mentioned in all the creeds. And it means that each will rise in, in his or her own body, which he had on earth, which God can put together even if you drown or if you are caught in a fire or you blow up. God can put all of that together. He's almighty. He can do anything he wants. And, uh, and we will also rise either for eternal life, an eternal life of happiness, or an eternal existence of unhappiness in hell. So the whole human race is going either to heaven or to hell. In the meantime, there is purgatory, but purgatory will end at the end of the world. But every single human being will end up either in heaven or in hell with his or her own body. That is the teaching of the church. Now, there is a very strong scriptural basis for this. St. Paul said, who, meaning Christ, will reform the body of our lowliness made like to the body of his glory, according to the operation, whereby also we, he is able to subdue all things unto himself. St. Paul also said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all indeed rise again, but we shall not all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise again incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Job said, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in the last day I shall rise out of the earth, and I shall be clothed again with my skin, and in my flesh I will see my God. Isaiah said, The dead men shall live, my slain shall rise again, awake and give praise, ye that dwell in the dust. And in 2 Maccabees, it says, uh, in the occasion that one of the seven brothers were martyred, speaking to the judge who has condemned him, he said, and when he was at the last gasp, he said thus, Thou indeed, O most wicked man, destroyest us out of this present life, but the king of the world will raise us up who die for his laws in the resurrection of eternal life. Our blessed Lord said, The hour cometh wherein all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that have done good things shall come forth unto the resurrection of life, but they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. He also said, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath, life, hath, hath everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. St. Paul again said, Now if Christ be preached, that he arose again from the dead, how do some among you say, There is no resurrection from the dead? But if there be no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen again. And if Christ be not risen again, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, 
And we are found false witnesses of God because we have given testimony against God that he hath raised up Christ, whom he hath not raised up if the dead not rise again. For if the dead rise not again, then neither is Christ risen again. So you see how St. Paul ties it to the very resurrection of Christ, that these two things are so tightly connected that if we are not rising again, then Christ did not rise again for the purpose of his rising was that we also rise. St. Paul also said, it, meaning the body, is sown in corruption. It shall rise in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It shall rise in glory. It is sown in weakness. It shall rise in power. It is sown a natural body. It shall rise a spiritual body. So there could... Sacred Scripture could not be more explicit about the resurrection of the body. Then there is the teaching of the Catholic Church, the Second Council of Lyons in 1274. The same Holy Roman Church, it says, firmly believes and firmly declares that on the day of judgment all men will be brought together with their bodies before the tribunal of Christ to render an account of their own deeds. Now what are the qualities of the glorified body? First there is impassibility. That means freedom from death and pain. Then there is agility, which means that the body will go anywhere that the soul wishes since it will be weightless. It will have something called subtility, which means that the body will be able to penetrate other bodies without difficulty. We see this in our blessed Lord, who, by the way, did not roll back the stone when he rose from the dead, but came through the stone. Just as he came through the virgin womb of the blessed Virgin Mary and did not open it, when he was born. So he came through the stone that held back his body in the tomb. It was the angel later who came back and rolled the stone. And then there will be clarity of the body. The body will have a certain brightness, something like our Lord's body at the transfiguration. Our Lord, because he was God, actually had to hold back the glory of his body in order not to frighten people or to, in some way, turn people away from him. You remember that the apostles, when they saw our blessed Lord at the transfiguration, hid their heads. They, they could not look for a long time because of the intensity of the glory. And so the, uh, the transfiguration was the normal way in which the body would be seen when attached to the second person of the Blessed Trinity. It would normally show all of the glory of God in that way. So he merely stopped uh, the suppression of the manifestation of this glory in order to transfigure himself before the, those apostles. So our bodies will not have the same glory, obviously, as our Lord's body, but nonetheless, the, the, the holiness of the soul will redound upon the body. So why must we wait for the resurrection of the body? Why did not Christ restore it to us right away? Well, first of all, our Lord applies the effects of his redemption to our souls, but not to our bodies. And why is this so? Because we must, by his grace, merit our own salvation by striving against the inclinations of the fallen nature 
and bringing into subjection our rebellious bodies. We must prove to him in this life that we love him above all things, in other words. That we love him more than sin, that we love him more than the flesh or more than gluttony or money, or whatever other enticements there are for this life. We love him more. We love him more than our own lives. And as you know, there were many people in your English ancestry who gave up their lives in order to love him more than this life because they wanted to remain Catholic even though their king wanted them to enter into a new religion. And that is why martyrdom is such a great thing. It is the ultimate crown of loving God more than this life. That's why they are so honored. It is the greatest possible imitation of the cross of Christ. And those who are martyred receive a great grace and accept their martyrdom as a crown, as a great blessing from God. The Carmelite nuns who were beheaded during the French Revolution went to their deaths uh, with this great, great, not only resignation, but joy. And an eyewitness said they looked like brides on their wedding day as they lined up and each one had her head chopped off. And they sang the Salve Regina as they waited to have their heads chopped off. That is the, the ultimate way in which we show that we love God above all things because we cling to this life more than we cling to anything else. Also, if baptism restored the renewal of the body, that is, if by being baptized you would live on this earth forever without any disease or pain or anything else, everyone would be baptized even without faith in order to have the benefits of the body. So they would be insincere. And furthermore, a glorified body has no place on an earth which still has the sentence of death upon it. Do you notice everything dies? All living things die. There is a sentence of death upon the earth. All these beautiful flowers that are coming out now, the trees, all the animals, they all die, no matter how beautiful they are. It all dies. It is a place of death. Life for a short time and death. And a glorified body has no place on such an earth. That's why our Lord ascended into heaven 40 days after Easter. He would have ascended on the very day that he rose from the dead, except that he wanted to prove his resurrection and also give further instructions to his apostles. But his, his glorified body belonged in heaven. It, it, it has no place here. And that's why our Blessed Lady was drawn to heaven in her Blessed Assumption, because she had no place here either. He preserved her from corruption, just as he preserved her from original sin. There was no place for her on this earth of death. And so she, she was assumed into heaven. Now, all of this said, this Catholic doctrine said, this sacred scripture said, listen to the heresies of Ratzinger who is seen, unfortunately, by many conservative Catholics as the restorer of the faith, a man of great Catholic faith and uh, staunch in his adherence to the traditional liturgy, etc. A hero. Just listen. In his book, Introduction to Christianity, he says, it now becomes clear that the real heart of faith in the resurrection does not consist at all in the idea of the resurrection of bodies. 
and referring to biblical pronouncements concerning the resurrection of the body, he says, their essential content is not the conception of a restoration of bodies to souls after a long interval. Both of those statements are utterly heretical, denying everything that the sacred scripture and the church teaches. Let us recall what St. Paul said. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen, then Christ is, is not risen again. How do you reconcile that with what Ratzinger said? And, and St. Paul said, And if Christ is, is not risen again, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is vain too. He says, And we are found false witnesses of God. In other words, we're preaching falsehood about God. He continues, because we have given testimony against God that, ha he, that he hath raised up Christ, whom he hath not raised up, if the dead rise not again. How could Ratzinger say these things? For if the dead rise not again, neither is Christ risen again. This is blatant heresy. And he actually consecrated a bishop in Italy who in a book denied the resurrection of, the, uh, denied the resurrection of Christ. And he himself said, it describes the resurrection in his life of Christ, as is Ratzinger, as uh, the apostles having a resurrection ex experience, that they, they had some sort of internal experience of Christ rising from the dead. So do not fall prey, therefore, to the popular belief, that, and which is getting ever more intense, that Ratzinger was some sort of restorer of the Catholic faith. He was not. He was a radical modernist. When I was in the seminary in the late 1960s, he was considered one of the radical modernists with Rahner and Kung. And he himself said, I have never changed. It's others who have changed around me as he got older. He's the, he was the same modernist always. And that is proven by his, his heresy in these works that he wrote, which he never, ever repudiated. So, let Easter be our feast of faith, believing not false witnesses, but believing St. Paul, who says, For I delivered you unto you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Kephas, and after that by the eleven. Then he was seen by more than five hundred brethren at once, of whom many remain until this present, and some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.